Careful, Visteria, said Murshid. There is great hate here. Visterio nodded as he rounded a promontory of fallen rock and steel. His bolter tracking to the source of the psychosonic assault. The prow of the craft had been split open in its abortive takeoff. A six-meter gash torn through the pilot's compartment. At first he could not understand what he was seeing. A host of cables trailed from the starship like a writhing colony of snakes. They were coupled with an outlandish device the function of which Visterio could not even begin to guess. But that was not the most surprising discovery. Lying on its side, partially crushed by a giant spar of steel, fallen from above, was the shattered outline of a dreadnought. Dust and ash lay thick on its adamantium sarcophagus. The colour of its armour, all but obscured. One leg had been sheared from its body, and its left side was buckled inwards so deeply that the flesh within was surely dead. Its weapon arms, a Keras pattern assault cannon, and a splay clawed power fist were aimed skyward, as if this ancient hero of the legions had sought to vent his fury towards the heavens with the last of his existence. The dreadnought lay upon something half buried in the rock of the cavern floor, its surface heat burned and unrecognizable. More cables snaked from the wrecked starship and were hooked into the object's underside, as well as to the war machine. A dreadnought, said Akhtar, lowering his weapon. Keep it covered, snapped Vistario, edging forward to better examine the strange device. It appeared to be a monstrous hybrid of musical instrument and an apparatus of excruciation designed by a sadistic lunatic. Its colours were faded now, but once it had been vividly painted and elaborately ornamented. It thrummed with energy, ripe with potential, and Visterio looked for a way to disconnect it. An angry buzzing built as he reached to unhook the nearest cable, as if the machinery were alive and aware of his intent. Do. Not. Visterio flinched at the sound, a grating, wheezing vox exhalation. He spun and brought his bolter up to aim at the not-so-dead-after-all dreadnought. His finger tightened on the trigger, then eased off as he found himself staring down the multiple barrels of the Keras assault cannon. You. Ah. Uh, not. Him. Said the dreadnought. Visterio slowly lowered his weapon, lifting his free hand away. Murshid was held in the dreadnought's fist, struggling in vain against strength that could tear open the hull of a land raider. Akhtar stood apart, his bolter trained unerringly on the dreadnought's sarcophagus. A gesture of defiance only. Even if the mass reactive penetrated a weak spot in the Dreadnought's body, Visterio and Murshid would be dead before Akhtar fired the first round. So long I have waited, said the Dreadnought. Forgot name. Forgot brothers. Only hate endured. Only vengeance sustained me. The towering biomachine's voice was redolent with power, its words halting at first, then growing in coherence, as if the very act of addressing the warriors before it was rekindling a memory of speech. Soft light built within the cracked, augmented orb that was all that remained of the War Machine sensorium. Could it see him? And what would it make of his war plate's colour? What legion are you? Fifteenth, said Vistario. The sons of Magnus the Red, the Cyclops, the Crimson King, Sorcerer Supreme, Master of Prospero. 
how fair the fifteenth after so long. Tell me you did not fall into the same trap as my brothers. Tell me you endure and yet stand at our father's side. He doesn't know, thought Visteria. All these years trapped below, and he doesn't know. How could he? The thousand suns endure, he said. I may be smashed and clinging to life, but I know evasion when I hear it. Visterio shrugged. You would not like the truth. My like or dislike for the truth is immaterial, said the Dreadnought. Truth is all we have. It is our shield against falsehoods. When facts can be twisted to become weapons, nothing good can endure. The Emperor taught me that, but too few of us took the lesson to heart, who understood how vital it was. Stereo briefly considered pointing out the lie that lay at the heart of the Emperor's Crusade, its corrosive effect like a poison pill, slowly dissolving under the tongue. But he needed no Corvidae foresight to know the Dreadnought would kill him instantly for such an utterance. What is your name? asked the Dreadnought. Malin Visterio of the Corvidae Fellowship. What is yours? I am he who remembers, said the Dreadnought. Or I used to be. An ancient mystic once said that it is the doom of men that they forget. But my memory is as broken now as my body. My purpose, I had one. It was to know, to remember. Examples of the past shape the present. Events of the future compel the past. Visterio was acutely aware of how precarious was his position. The Dreadnought was clearly insane. After the long centuries spent in isolation, without tech marines to minister the complex biomechanical cycles of his existence and maintain his fugue state of slumber. What were you to know? He asked. To know what, you ask? Growled the Dreadnought in irritation. Shells clattered as rusted autoloaders slammed them into the assault cannon. Does not the 15th Retain one whose task is to know, to see everything. I once knew all the things that mattered. Names, dates, places, things of moment. The oaths taken, the oaths broken, the litanies of the faithless. I am he who remembers. I am the ancient of rights. A sudden flash of prescience swept through Visterio, and he craned his neck to look around the chamber, his mind's eye racing back the way they had come to the surface. He saw the war-racked world above as the bombs fell from orbit, shattering the city and laying waste to those who defended it. I... I know this world's name, he said as its terrible legacy poured into him. Yes, said the Dreadnought. Of course you do. Horus cut it into the heart of every legionary, whether they were there or not. This is Istvan III. Yes. And you, said Vistario, you are... I am Ancient Rylanor, said the Dreadnought. 
ancient Rylanor. Bisterio knew the name. How could he not? The tale spun around the betrayal at Isvan III filled entire wings of the gallery at Pergamum. This was where the canker at the heart of the legions was first revealed. Where the legions had first spilled blood of their brothers in open warfare. Magnus had dispatched cabal after cabal, seeking truth from those who had fought in the battle, desiring to unravel its root cause. It seemed to Visterio to be a thankless task, for every adept of the Corvidae knew that nothing ever really began. There could be no single moment from which this or any other event sprang. The threads could always be followed to some earlier moment, and the actions that preceded them. To attempt to pin any event's origin to a single moment in time would drive a mind to insanity. Perhaps it already has, thought Visteria, thinking of the desperate need he pretended not to see in his Primarch's gaze. Those who had fought through the virus scoured hellscapes of Isvan III, described loyalist warriors of the World Eaters, Death Guard, sons of Horus and Emperor's children, fighting for months against their brothers, enduring unimaginable horrors in the face of inevitable extinction. The only mention of the Dreadnought's fate came from the most unreliable of narrators, Lucius the Swordsman, who claimed Saul Tarvid spoke of the underground hangar the Dreadnought was rumored to have found. Why did you not escape? asked Visterio. I would have, but the seismic shockwaves of his fan's death went deeper and lasted longer than any could have foreseen. The roof of the cavern collapsed, trapping me here as you see. Visterio glanced at the strange device hooked to the interior of the wrecked warship. And what is that? A sonic weapon of some kind. A handful of my former brothers found this place and sought to kill me. They failed, but the power of their weapons crippled me and left me as you see me now. And you wrought it into... What? A distress beacon of some kind? The Dreadnought's Vox Caster grated with what Visterio took to be a rueful chuckle. <laughs> a distress beacon, said Rylanor. No. A lure. A lure for what? The sound of dead skin slipping over rock sent a chill down Visterio's spine. A silken voice answered the Dreadnought's question. For me, it said. Isn't that right, Rylanor? Visterio's mouth fell open as a towering serpentine shape emerged from the shadows of the cavern. Multi-limbed, sinuous, and beautiful. Ivory white hair spilled across the shocking purple of the sculpted war plate. At last, said Rylanor. Fulgrim. The Primarch was an abomination, even by the standards of warriors who had seen their own father hideously changed by the transformative energy of the great ocean. Stereo felt aether fire pulsing from within Fulgrim's body. His ability to manipulate its energy is massively powerful, yet unsubtle. Swords glittered at his midsection, and his eyes roved the chamber, taking the measure of the present tableau. How long had he been watching and listening? In the centuries since the Battle of Terror, the Phoenician's behavior defied rational understanding or a sense of predictability. Magnus himself had given up any form of prognostication concerning his brother's actions. But how could Visterio even begin to predict what Fulgrim might do next? Ancient, said Fulgrim, sliding over the floor with grotesque peristaltic motions. You look terrible. A disgrace, even. 
What has become of you, my Primarch? Said Lylanor, his horrified disgust clear, even through the degraded quality of his Voxcaster. You are a monster. Says the scrap of ruined flesh maintained by grotesque machinery, said Fulgrim, circling the four of them. His pale eyes were pearlescent orbs without pupils, soulless and devoid of anything that had once made him great. They regarded the warriors before him with only passing interest. Why does Magnus send his broken sons to Istvan III? Did you learn nothing from the wolf's destruction of Prospero? My hermit brother should know by now that his meddlesome curiosity only leads to disaster. Asterio fought to find his voice. Always a problem in the face of a Primarch. Doubly so, in the presence of one so altered. Yet even though Fulgrim's appearance had changed so terribly, pangs of longing stirred in Vesterio's breast. We, we heard his message, he managed. Too bad for you, said Fulgrim with a grin, taking in their predicament. Mershid still hung like a limp fish in Rylanor's grip. Vesterio was covered by the assault cannon, and Akhtar stood immobile. His weapon trained unerringly upon the dreadnought sarcophagus. The Phoenician approached Rylanor. So, old friend, said Fulgrim, you have my attention. And what is it you want me to hear? And do try to make it diverting. After all, you've had millennia to perfect it. Rylanor dropped Mershid and used the wheezing, grating limb to push its carapace upright. Vesterio saw the muzzle of the assault cannon track away from him, following the Primarch's movements. He eased his mind into the warlike enumerations, letting the power of the great ocean into his flesh. Be ready, he sent to his brothers, a flash of thought only. He felt their understanding and flexed his psyche in readiness for the wielding of his powers. Conflicting visions pressed upon the meniscus of his mind. Shredding bullets and mass reactives, fire and an unstoppable tide of virulent destruction. The omens are not good. Dust and rubble fell from Rylanor's armor like sand in an hourglass. Fresh portions of the smashed object beneath the dreadnought's body were revealed and humming power cables ran from Rylanor's sarcophagus to an opened control panel. Mysterio felt his blood chill as he finally understood what it was. Has it truly been a millennia? Asked Rylanor, his voice stronger now, coming from a time long ago and filled with infinite sadness and patient regret. It has said Fulgrim, moving closer. Think of all that time wasted, all the glory unearned, all the victories denied. Rylanor gave another grating bark of laughter. Glory? You think I sought glory? How little you understand of your own legion. Yes. I have indeed perfected what I wish you to hear, said Rylanor, as Fulgrim reached out to touch him. And though I am sure you will find it diverting, it will not be me that says it. Fulgrim's grin faltered as he too saw what the Dreadnought's body had obscured. No, he said as if he thought he could stop what was about to happen with a word. Yes, said Rylanor, sending an activating pulse of energy to the armed warhead of an unexploded virus bomb. Vesterio saw the moment of detonation a fraction of a second before it happened. 
Instantaneously, he beheld a vision of the explosive spread of the Life Eater virus as it consumed them, dissolving like frost before the sun. He saw their doomed bodies transformed into replicating flesh refineries in which the hyper-evolving viral strands mutated and found ever more inventive ways of destroying organic material. All of this he witnessed in the space between life and death, the most fleeting glimpse into an inevitable future. But a fleeting glimpse wasn't all an adept of the Corvidae needed. Actor! Already in the blunt, pugnacious enumerations, Actar was unleashing his power, even as the detonation circuits of the virus bomb triggered. The casing shattered as the explosive heart of the bomb cracked open, and isolated viral compounds mixed in the precise amounts to catalyze the unstoppable reaction. Fire bloomed from the warhead in torturous slow motion, lapping around Rylanor's sarcophagus like low-grade viscous Prometheum. I cannot hold it for long, cried Actar. His Raptora powers stretched to their limits in holding back the explosion. Visterio reached out with his mind and poured his powers into the warrior, feeling Mersh do the same. Thorgrim laughed as the creeping death slid slowly over the Dreadnought's body. Is this it? He said. You sought to draw me here to kill me. Rylanor triggered his assault cannon, but fast as quicksilver, Thorgrim caught it and crushed it before it could fire. No, I don't think so, said the Primarch, effortlessly ripping the arm from the Dreadnought's body. Sparks flew from the ruptured limb, and Thorgrim gave the weapon a dismissive glance before tossing it aside. You betrayed us! bellowed Rylanor. Your sons, you led us here to die. There is no forgiveness for that. None. You must die by my hand. The Emperor's justice will fall upon you. Not even Fulgrim, the Illuminator, can escape the Life Eater. Thorgrim leaned in close to Rylanor and shook his head. You wish me dead, he said, scathing pity dripping from every syllable. Why? Because you think I betrayed you, the Legion. Oh, Rylanor, your thoughts are so narrow. If you could only see us now. How beautiful we have become. We shine so brightly, each of us a brilliant sun. Borgrim reached down, sliding his bare hand inside a rent torn in the Dreadnought's armor. He smiled, closing his eyes and letting his tongue slip across his lips as he pushed deeper inside. Ah, there you are, said Fulgrim, as Rylanor's Voxcaster grated in fury. Wet and wriggling, I can feel your panic. It's delicious. Rylanor's power fist swung around, bathed in fire. It struck Fulgrim on the shoulder, but Actar's psychic force was not simply confined to the Life Eater's detonation. Thorgrim laughed off the sluggish attack, and one of his lower arms drew a glittering sword of alien origin. The blade sliced in a cruelly precise arc, cutting through the fiber bundle motivators and servos. Rylanor's arm fell limp at his side. Visterio watched the viral fire spread over the dreadnought's carapace, slipping inside his buckled plates of armor. Rylanor did not care, 
whether he lived or died. Only that Thorgrim went with him. Do not do this, barked the Dreadnought. Why not? I am your master. I can do whatever I like. I can crush you, or I can raise you up. Return to the Legion, accept the gifts of the Dark Prince, and you will walk at my side, clad once again in flesh. You can be anything, old friend. I will sculpt you into something beautiful. A god to these mortals. Never. All we have left between us is that we will die together. Lord of the Dreadnought. The upper portion of his carapace burned with blue flames. I am Rhinanor of the Emperor's Children, Ancient of Rites, Venerable of the Palatine Host, and Proud Servant of the Emperor of Mankind, Beloved by all. I reject you, now and always. Thorgrim laughed and said, I'm sorry. Did it sound like I was offering you a choice? The Primarch wrenched his hand from Rylanor's sarcophagus, dragging a sopping mass of fluid and matter with him. Glutinous ropes dripped from his fingers. He was like a midwife, holding a mewling newborn. Ruptured cables spilled amniotic fluid, so stagnant it must surely have been poisoning Rylanor with every passing second. I will remake you, brother, said Fulgrim. You will be my crowning achievement. Though his body was little more than rags of wet meat, Visteria sensed Rylanor's horror at this last violation. An inescapable destiny, where he would become that which he hated most. What do we do? The question was Mercia's, and the connection between the Thousand Sons was so strong that the Athanians' perception for emotions spread to all three of them. Asterio felt Fulgrim's infinite malice, his cruel enjoyment of Rylanor's anguish, and the helplessness of the Thousand Sons. The Primarch of the Emperor's children reveled in his overweening pride. A trait Magnus had more than once told Visterio had been present long before his fall. But more than anything, stronger even than Fulgrim's spite, Visterio felt Rylanor's pride and honor. The unbending core of greatness that had set him against his brothers and seen him descend into obsessive madness beneath the surface of a dead world. Asterio took the measure of Fulgrim, seeing nothing worthy in him. His warriors felt the moment his decision was made. Primarch Fulgrim, sent Vistario. Rylanor deserves better than you. The Primarch looked up, his once bright eyes now black and filled with the darkest poison. He deserves better than all of us. He raised his bolter and fired a mass reactive into the back of Akhtar's skull. The raptor's head exploded, and with his death, the psychic force holding back the warhead's detonation ended. Fisterio saw fire, and once more, all life burned. It took much less time for the Life Eater to burn out on Isvan III's second death. Its first ending had claimed eight billion lives, snuffed out in a matter of hours when Horus launched his bombardment from the Vengeful Spirit. With such plentiful mortal flesh to fuel the Biokiller's fury, the psychic scream was said to have ellipsed the Astronomicon itself. Shadow emerged from the Undercity, 
a serpentine outline of cinders held together by a web of never-born energy. Not even the viral toxins wrought by ancient science could unmake that which the darkest powers of the warp had raised up. Phoenician's form was already weaving itself anew, but his soul was broken. For no pain, no hurt, and no injury could wound such a being as much as denial of its magnificence. That was ancient Rylanor's final victory. <laughs>